Hello, fellow R practitioners. My name is Zubin. We've got the next 15 minutes of your time. We are going to educate you on a package we have in CRAN called HVT, new HVT. It stands for hierarchical Voroni tessellations. And we'll show you how we use that to create this sensing apparatus on complex systems. So what we're gonna talk about the agenda is as follows. I'll spend five minutes with you, kind of give you a zoom, a big zoom out why we're doing this. And then we'll introduce a gentleman named Sengi. He'll take you how we're representing these complex systems, you know, so we can monitor them and sense their movement. And then we'll give you a live demo and a gentleman named Shubra will take you through that. So the kind of the big picture what spawned a lot of this uh, capability is the idea of, um, you know, enterprises moving into the thing called prescriptive analytics. You know, you have this DIPP framework, descriptive, inquisitive, predictive, and then prescriptive. That kind of gives a nice paradigm of a lot of the analytics that Fortune 500 companies are doing today. And we really feel it's a, it, it, they're all, um, you know, playing notes. They're all, think of them as musical instruments and playing music of data science. It's not like a maturity. They're all interrelated. They're all very important. But however, we're seeing uh, clients starting to ask us more difficult questions to answer uh, beyond predictive. They're asking us questions like, you know, we have no data. We want to build it. We want to, you, know, you know, introduce a new product. Or, you know, we want to uh, change price in a very competitive environment. Um, you know, when the, when the competitor would do this, this, and this, what do we think our outcome will be? So now we're getting into evaluate policy changes. We're getting in, into classic prescriptive analytics where simulation is the workhorse here, okay? So given that environment, what happens is, is that, okay, you have to think about, all right, what kind of system are we actually intervening in, all right? So, for example, here is a decision maker. They had to make a decision, you know, go left or go right. So they make a decision, now they feel much better. But, you know, however, over time, this decision could have been incorrect, right? Where this come back to bite them. And we call these unanticipated consequences. You know, this is really when you're dealing with systems that um, you're using potentially methods that aren't designed for that type of a system. You're not kind of anticipating or learning about these types of uh, feedback effects, right? And you can get into positions like this. And th there could be lags here. This could be a year, two years, three years, et cetera, before you, you see these, these negative externalities from this decision. So this is uh, when you get into, okay, well, you know, what's going on here? W what's causing this stuff? Well, you know, a lot of the data scientists today are very comfortable and well, decision science is very comfortable. And, you know, and I think it's very deceiving. And what, what, what you have to really do is differentiate between two types of systems, complicated or complex systems. And most people assume with the methodologies or methods they're using today, they're dealing with a comp complicated system where you can think of it as assembly line uh, and you have components that are interacting in somewhat predictable ways. And a lot of our correlation-based techniques that we're using here work pretty well, especially even work and help predict these systems. But when you get into prescriptive, now we're actually making policy changes and moving le levers. That assumes that there's causality now. I'm moving this lever. I'm assuming my left-hand side, my Y variables will be going to be affected. So now we're getting into causality. Okay. So it's a little different game, especially when you're dealing with a complex system. All right, let me define that complex system in the next slide. But I feel most of the systems that we, we work with are most likely complex systems. And using, uh, understanding that really kind of changes your mindset on the, on, the, on, the, on the types of techniques you should be doing in them and the actual paradigm to actually go after that system, right? So here's examples of complex systems. They're actually, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. We see them in Bangalore traffic. We see them in ants and how they self-organize to make bridges. We see them when we look in the sky and see birds flocking, right? These are all complex systems. There's an agent, there's feedback, there's no central coordinator. You know, bottom line, a lot of the interventions we're doing, um, you know, in, in analytics uh, for prescriptive, you're actually working in a complex system, especially dealing with supply chains and customer behavior and things like that, right? And so there's a whole science to this. There's a gentleman named Brian Castellini who creates this. Also, we, we get a lot of inspiration from Brian uh, on how to actually go about monitoring and control, if possible, of a complex system. And I would recommend you check some of his work out. So some of the big areas here are dynamic systems theory and networks and agent-based modeling. The reason I'm bringing that up to you is when you, you start realizing that the bottom line, you're dealing with an organism, okay? It really, that was the big aha for us is that you are dealing with an organism. So how do you go about monitoring? How do you go about intervening? How do you go about predicting uh, descriptive, inquisitive, and predictive on an organism? 
All right. So again, we get a, uh, um, we get some um, inspiration from robotics, um, sense, plan, and act. And so the bottom line is um, is the following: you have to really get good at sensing. I mean, that, that's the number one thing you should need to be doing. When you realize you have a complex system, a lot of times you have unanticipated consequences. Uh, novel detection becomes very important. What's called, you know, looking for change points and outliers and novelties. Um, there's a whole class of, uh, or anomalies. There's a whole class of, of methodologies around that. Shannon entropy, surprise, real, that's the information I want. And so we call that intelligent reporting. We're saying, okay, here's your reporting layer. You know, how do I make my reporting more intelligent and showing me exceptions and, and novelties versus just, uh, you know, just plain Jane business intelligence reporting. So you're basically really, really the bottom line is you have to get good at sensing. You have to create this sensing apparatus, sense this complex system. So you have to understand, you have to understand states and trajectories and how to monitor and, and model all these cases that we're seeing. So that's the bottom line. Get really, really good at sensing. Build this sensing apparatus, and then you can move to thinking and acting. All right. So that's that's our game plan here, and that's really the genesis behind this HVT package. All right. So now I'll introduce Sangi, who'll take you through a little bit more details on our, our point of view for this uh, outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Zubin, for putting emphasis on the need for complexity sciences in enterprises. Now we'll move forward with our agenda. That is, how do we represent a complex system? But before we move ahead with it, let's talk about why we need it across multiple domains and what are the major problems that have been foreseen in the past. One of them is organized simplicity, which involves only a few variables like relating pressure and temperature in thermodynamics or relating population versus time. These types of problems were the focus of the 19th and 20th century in disciplines like physics, chemistry, biology, etc. Then there's disorganized complexity, which involves billions or even trillions of variables. The key lies in our assumption that there's little interaction among variables. This is what allows us to take meaningful interpretation from them. Then finally, the problem with organized complexity, which involves a model to a large number of variables with strong nonlinear interactions. This means that the variables cannot be meaningfully interpreted. These are problems which involves dealing simultaneously with a sizable number of factors which are interrelated into an organic whole. And this is, this is what emergence is all about. This organic whole, which actually refers to the dynamic emergent behavior of the system over time, which was actually nicely put down by Warren Weaver in 1948. This, he's the person behind information theory and Sanus entropy, obviously alongside Claude Sanus. Hmm. Now that we talked about emergence, let me tell you multiple behavior emerges in a complex system. And these behaviors are divided into discrete cases based on structural similarity, which ends up giving a condensed representation of the entire complex system. And this ever process that I was talking about can be repeated in a hierarchical manner to get a more microscopic view into the sub behaviors of the system and using our new HVT package on CRAM. And this is achieved using techniques from unsupervised learning, computational geometry, and multidimensional scaling. So, to get a more understanding, a more intuitive idea behind this, my colleague Subra will take over and give you a very nice demo that we have built in-house. Thank you. Thanks, Sangeet. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to kick off with the shiny application that we built on top of the new HVT package at New Sigma Lab. Let's build your intuition about what this thing does. We'll start with the torus. The torus here is a three-dimensional object. The data set shown here has three columns, X, Y, and Z. 
let's say you knew nothing about the data set. You have three columns and you need to learn about it. So what you can do is run it through the application. The plot here shows you what the image looks like. So you can see here how we are able to recreate the image in a pretty good way while significantly preserving the structure. So these cells here are called tessellations and these points are known as centroids. We can use this information in a couple of ways. One is we are able to compress the high dimensional data and we can visualize it. Every single data point that was shown in the raw data maps into this area. These areas can be thought of as a spatial map where each region or state is represented by a capital or centroid. So let me show you another data set here. So this is the computer data set which has 10 columns and around 6,250 entries. So this is the projection of the data set. And this is the heat map of features overlaid on top of the tessellation. So here we are overlaying the price feature. So you can see the points here that are closer together to each other are very similar and points that are very far away are different. Points here in bottom right corner are marked in blue that corresponds to a high price and points in the top left corner are yellowish signifying low prices. Let's move further with the steps involved in the algorithm. So we begin with the scaling of data set. The distance computation in any quantization algorithm weighs each dimension equally. So to avoid distortion in the relative nearness of observations caused by unit of dimension, we unit normalize each dimension individually. Then we move ahead to vector quantize the data set. Here you can see in the right top image a number line representing numbers from 1 to 7. Instead of representing everything, we choose a central value to represent the chunk. For example, to do this, numbers between 0 to 1.9 are represented as 1, those between 2 to 3.9 are represented as 2, and so on. So talking in terms of a data set having multiple columns, this algorithm allows the scattered data points to organize together. Further, using the vector quantization, we partition the observations in raw data into k segments based on the similarity, in which each observation is mapped to the suitable centroid in an n-dimensional space. The number of centroids here is user-defined and can be set according to the need. Now, we have the coordinates for these k clusters in an n-dimensional space. We use the Salmon's mapping to project these points to a space of lower dimensionality while preserving the structure. Salmon's mapping aims to minimize the error function, which takes into consideration the distance between the points in original space and corresponding distance after projection. The minimization of this function is performed by involving iterative methods. Now, so that we have the centroid mapped to a 2D space, we proceed with the visualization using Voronoi tessellation. The spatial mapping shown here is nature inspired. We took inspiration from leaves. If you see in the right image, the entire leaf area is divided into chunks by larger veins and further division of these chunks by smaller veins. Similarly, we have this multi-level spatial visualization in our tool. So there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this tool. You can use it for monitoring customer segments, generating recommendation algorithms. You can use this for macro and micro segmentation to unify that all together. It's just a very powerful tool. So I didn't do it justice here. There's a lot more things this application can do. Now Sangeet will showcase how this application can be leveraged for a panel data. Thank you, Subra, for the intuitive understanding of the Mu SVT package using the wonderful Torus demo. Now we will represent a complex system, which in our case is the financial market, and monitor them over time. For this demo, we will be using peer data from the US equity market, which works on the principle of statistical arbitrage. So, without any further ado, let's dive into the demo. So, here, as you can see, we are starting off with some data pre-processing, like ignoring unwanted columns, selecting dependent Y variable, selecting a unique identifier column made up of event time, which is at a 5 second tick level, along with the name of our peer. Then we move ahead and select our time series column and its format, followed by the panel column, which is in fact our peer name. 
So now we are gonna take a deep dive into the second level to introduce more granularity in our data. So now what we have here is the Explorer tab, which is built using D3 on top of Sine, and this is using our new HVT model object. So let me explain what we are trying to do here. First off, we will select the dependent variable to know where our per profit reaches are. Secondly, I'll select a pair to monitor it over time. So as you can see here, the total time window is of a day and at a five second level and ranging from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. EST. So now that I have selected a pair here that is SPY and SDS, let's monitor. So as you can see, the centroids are getting highlighted in certain regions. This shows that our selected pair is moving in between those regions. And there's a start and there's an end. So this path that the pair traced for us can tell us how it entered profitable region and sometimes even non-profitable ones. So let's get a peek of the cell where our pair ended in, followed by all the other pairs that showed similar behavior. So now I have selected my region where my pair ended in. And as you can see, these are the observations of all the other pairs that are present in that region. And here is the centroid table, which basically talks about the type and the information for all the pairs in that particular region. Hmm. So second, this plot, keep in mind, this is very important as it tells us about the major contributor for the behavior of our pair. And as you can see, the Z score and the P value between those stocks that made up our pair are causing this behavior. Not only this, mu SVT can be used in a wide spectrum of problems from discovering groups of similar customers based on spending patterns and understanding price sensitivity of customers to detecting anomalies in sensor-driven industries where we can use mu SVT to find faulty turbines to damage oil rigs and many other monitoring use cases. We are not going to cover all of them here, but you can always refer to the vignette. So on a closing note, as you can see, we are only monitoring a complex system using historic trade data. But think about the possibilities once we can predict the next step for a particular pair, something that we are currently researching on. And remember, always go through the documentation. It really helps. Thank you.